In horses, trichophyton equinum is the most common species, and just like in dogs and cats, infections are typically superficial. Lesions are most commonly on the axilla or rump, and then they spread to the head and limbs. The lesions begin as a reddened, raised area, and after about a week, the hair falls out. So again, we're seeing alopecia. The lesions become crusty and scabby, and hair regrowth starts sort of three to four weeks uh, following the initial presentation. In this image here, you can see some alopecia lesions on a horse um, associated with equine dermatophytosis. Um, the species here was not actually defined, but probably it's a trichophyton equinum. In cattle, trichophyton varicosum is the most common species, and lesions, again, are most common on the head and neck. You can see on this cow here, these sort of gray alopecia spots all over the head and neck, very, very classical clinical signs of ringworm in cattle. Oftentimes, the lesions develop heavy gray crusts, and we can get, as I said, alopecia spots. Importantly, these infections are not typically pyritic, so the animals aren't itchy, and they generally don't seem to be terribly uh, bothered by the ringworm infection. I've put a link to a video above where you can see uh, some cattle in a barn with ringworm and get somewhat of an idea of what this looks like in real living animals. This is a severely affected uh, cow. We can see pretty severe uh, dermatophytosis of the head and neck caused by trichophyton varicosum. And I think what you can appreciate here are these thick gray crusting lesions um, all over the head with, of course, alopecia as well. In people, ringworm is very common. Um, presentation depends on the site of infection, and it can occur at a variety of body sites. Uh, risk factors include use of public showers, contact sports, so particularly things like wrestling, uh, tight shoes, people who sweat excessively, so uh, keeping sort of a warm and moist environment on the body, and then also animal contact. Uh, ringworm is a very, very important zoonosis, and contact with animals is a great way to get these infections. Here you can see some images from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and the National Health Service in the U.K. just showing what ringworm can look like. So these sort of classical reddened erythematous lesions on the skin. We can have ringworm on the scalp, again associated with alopecia. And we also have dermatophytes, which are responsible for athlete's foot and nail bed infections. I've put a link to a video above where you can see a patient visiting a dermatologist's office and having his athlete's foot evaluated. One thing that really stood out to me in this video is that the physician wasn't wearing gloves. We know that the dermatophytes do readily transmit between individuals, and so wearing personal protective equipment is always a good idea. In people, these are just some recommendations from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control on how to prevent ringworm, so keeping the skin clean and dry, wearing shoes that let your feet breathe, um, not walking barefoot in public lockers or showers, not sharing towels, um, ensuring that you have adequate hand hygiene after playing with animals or working with animals in the case of future veterinarians, showering immediately after sports, and changing socks and underwear daily. So you want to make sure that your undergarments are clean. Sample collection and handling is not entirely intuitive. So when we have uh, dermatophytosis, it's important to pluck hairs rather than clipping them. The fungi are more likely to be present in the base of the hair. And so if you simply cut off the ends of the hairs, um, the diagnostic lab may not be able to identify the organism. Ideally, you also want to preferentially pluck damaged looking hairs. So if there is some uh, broken hair shafts, uh, those may be more likely to have fungal organisms. You can collect scabs from the edge of the lesion. And then this one is unique to veterinary medicine. We can do brushings. Um, so using really just a toothbrush, if you can actually see the lesions, focus your toothbrushing in those areas. If not, uh, brush the hair coat all over the animal for two to three minutes. This is a great strategy, particularly for cats. And what you want to do after collecting those brushings is actually send the toothbrush to the lab in a sterile container. In severe cases, collecting biopsies can also be very useful to identify the organisms um, in situ. I put a link above to a video demonstrating how samples are collected from people with dermatophytosis. 
The video is a little bit gross, but it is an excellent resource and really nicely describes how samples can be collected. Once the lab receives the samples, they can prepare KOH wet mounts, so potassium hydroxide of hairs, nails, scabs, any of the tissues associated with the lesions. This strong base then degrades the host tissues and makes the fungal elements more apparent. Um, these can then also be stained using calcofluor, which really helps them to stand out. Fungal cultures are also possible, so we have dermatophyte test media, and of course they can be looked at histologically. A patient side diagnostic thing can be done is the woods lamp fluorescence, so shining that UV light on your patient. It's important to know that 50% of microsporum canis will glow under UV light. So if your patient does glow, it's highly suggestive of a diagnosis of microsporum canis. If they don't glow, it certainly doesn't rule it out. They could still have a dermatophyte which simply doesn't fluoresce, either a non-fluorescent microsporum canis or another species. Ringworm should always be considered zoonotic. Um, three and a half percent of human dermatophytes are caused by microsporum canis, and these are coming from animals. Patients who are more at risk of severe disease include children, the elderly, transplant and cancer patients. It's been estimated that up to 50% of people living in a household with infected cats will develop a lesion, so it is very, very common. Um, interestingly, cats have also been shown to carry trichophyton rubum, which is the agent of athlete's foot, and transmission has been suspected. Transmission between animals has also been reported, um, so between cats and agricultural animals. So this isn't just a matter of zoonotic transmission, but it's really between animal species. Most cases of dermatophytosis are ultimately self-limiting. Um, in dogs and cats, we treat these infections using a three-pronged approach. So environmental decontamination, that's the bleaching of hard surfaces, removing soft surfaces, and ideally vacuum with a vacuum that can be thrown away, topical therapy with enoconazole, and systemic therapy with azoles, terbenafin, or griseofulvin. In horses, shampoos can be used, and in cattle and small ruminants, there are enoconazole rinses. In severe cases, or for more information, I would definitely recommend consultation with a veterinary dermatologist. I don't have any new terms for today, but I do have a couple of questions for self-assessment. Mm -hmm.